Good morning. I have the honor to introduce my colleague and my friend, Dr. Virginia Lee. Dr. Virginia Lee is Associate Professor of Christian Education and Director of Deacon Studies here at Garrett Evangelical and has served in various capacities at numerous churches as a deacon in full connection with the Virginia Annual Conference. She has also published articles in both academic and lay journals and has been an active participant in educational and ministerial forums and conferences. And Dr. Lee is a doctor is a doctorate of education, has a doctorate of education from Union Theological Seminary and Presbyterian School of Christian Education. That's the stuff y'all already know about. On a personal note, let me say how thankful I am for the partnership that Dr. Lee and I have formed to reimagine re Christian education through the ministry lens of child advocacy and the offering of one example of public theology through the establishment this summer of a, this coming summer of a freedom school in the Evanston community. And I'm excited about the work uh, she and I will offer and I'm ex excited particularly about this presentation today. I'm not a mother, but I have children. Hearing the voices of my children. Let us welcome Dr. Virginia Lee. Thanks, Reggie. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Blunt, and I also am very happy and excited about the collaboration. One of the best things that about coming to Garrett four years ago has been gaining such wonderful faculty colleagues in all disciplines, but especially in my discipline of Christian education. Reggie, Margaret Ann, and Jack are not only colleagues, but they've become friends as well. My teaching and scholarship has been enriched by the conversations that I've had with such gifted colleagues. I want to thank President Rector and Garrett Evangelical for the opportunity to take a sabbatical last fall. I had the opportunity to begin a project that continues to inform and energize my ministry, my teaching, and my life. This is certainly not a finished project, but rather today my attempt to share with you what I've been doing and to elicit some of your thought in thinking through these questions. I want to begin with a prayer by Marion Wright Edelman, the founder of Children's Defense Fund, who's given her life to the advocacy of children. Let us pray. Oh God, help us recover our hope for our children's sake. Help us to recover our courage for our children's sake. Help us to recover our discipline for our children's sake. Help us to recover our ability to work together for our children's sake. Help us to recover our values for our children's sake. Help us to recover a spirit of sacrifice for our children's sake. Help us to recover our faith in you for our children's sake. Amen. Two years ago, I applied for my sabbatical and I outlined what I planned to do during that time and my sabbatical was approved. During the semester that preceded that sabbatical, Reggie, Jack, and I had a conversation during a Christian education field meeting where we began to think about Christian education and public theology. During that meeting, Reggie and I both shared about our previous engagement with Children's Defense Fund and their resources, and we both discovered that we had a shared interest in attending the Proctor Institute for Child Advocacy Ministry at Haley Farm in Tennessee, and a shared interest in sponsoring and, um, sponsoring and supporting a freedom school. It was at Haley Farm that summer that I realized that my sabbatical research would be very different than that I had anticipated. It was at Haley Farm that I discovered a community and network of persons who were committed to child advocacy and justice for children. I remember after the first orientation session, I remarked, these are my people. 
I want to take just a few minutes to tell you a few things about my life. I think it's important for you to know a little bit about who I am and how it relates to the title of my lecture and my work in child advocacy. I'm not a mother, but I have children hearing the voices of my children. The first part of that, the quote, I'm not a mother, but I have children, is from Mercy Odioye, a Methodist woman acknowledged most often as the mother of African theologies. When I first read her words in an article by Marcia Bungie, in Marcia Bungie's book, The Child and Christian Thought, they so resonated with me. The quote expressed my own philosophy and theology about caring for children, and it echoes phrases I have expressed. I grew up on a dairy farm in central Virginia in an extended family intergenerational household. As a child, that household included my grandfather, my grandmother, my mother, my father, my brother Travis Young, my brother Danny, and my dad's two unmarried uncles who farmed with him, my uncles Jimmy and Bobby. Bobby and Jimmy were not biological fathers, but they helped raise a lot of children. They helped raise my brothers and me, other nieces and nephews, great nieces and nephews, and now great, great nieces. I've always said that I grew up with three fathers, and I loved it. I was baptized at six weeks of age and attended Rocky Run United Methodist Church, or Rocky Run Methodist Church at the time, which was about two miles away from my home. It was the church that my family had attended for generations. It was at this church that I taught my first vacation Bible school class as a teenager and was told that I had a gift for teaching and a gift for working with children. This was in the late 1970s, and teaching school was considered an appropriate job for women. Now, of course, this was not stated explicitly, but I got the message very clearly, and I rebelled against that notion. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but it was certainly not teach elementary or high school. It was in college that I discovered the field of sociology, and I was fascinated studying systems and behaviors. But after graduating with a degree in sociology and looking for jobs in social work, which were hard to find at the time, I took a position as a substitute teacher in the public school system that I had attended. I thought it was a way to make ends meet until I could find a real job. After teaching in a different classroom every day for about a semester, and after gaining a reputation for being an effective, consistent, and reliable teacher, I was offered a permanent substitute position for a teacher who was taking a medical leave. I was thrilled because it meant a permanent job from, May, from January until May in one classroom with an increase in pay. That excitement lasted until I walked into that third grade classroom the first day and found 28 children, 25 of whom were boys, three students who had been held back more than one grade. It was a school that had a cafeteria, but it didn't have tables. It was a kitchen, but only had a serving line. So children went through the line each day to get their lunch and then brought it back to the classroom to eat. The only time I was not in the classroom with children all day long was at recess. It became obvious that very first day in the classroom that the class had had no discipline, no rules, and no structure for the whole first semester. This was in the 1980s, and I had third grade children routinely tell me to shut up, go to hell, and walk out of the classroom whenever they felt like it. I was a novice teacher with very little training, and so my answer to begin with was to spend five hours a night preparing for school the next day because it was the only way I could survive. It was called keep them busy. I learned the first week that if you threatened a consequence, you must follow through with it, and I learned to never threaten to take away recess. I only did that one time because that was the only time I got outside of the classroom as well. It took about a month to create a classroom with shared rules and boundaries. These were not bad children. They were children who needed someone to care about them, to listen to them, and to hear them. Within, 
while that first month was probably the hardest month I've ever had experienced in my teaching, the remaining five months were actually quite enjoyable and quite eye-opening. The children and I learned so much from each other. I continued to substitute teach, and a few years later, I came to understand my call to educational ministry, but that's another story for another day. So I'll fast forward about 10 years, and after seminary, I took a position at a church in Richmond, Virginia, as the Minister of Age Level Ministries and Mission. That meant I was responsible for children and youth ministries. On trips like retreats and mission trips, I'd often be in public with a lot of children or youth surrounding me. And on many of those occasions, someone would look at the children closest to me and say, are those your children? And I remember the first time I was asked that, I didn't hesitate. I looked around at all the other children with me and said, they're all my children. And I meant it. At that time and still today, I take seriously the vows that I make at the baptism of a child. In the United Methodist Baptismal Liturgy, the congregation is asked, will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons, this child or these children, now before you in your care? And the congregation, I, respond, with God's help we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons, children, with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. I have a responsibility for them. They're the children of the community. But it's not just the children of my church or my denomination or other denominations for whom I'm responsible. It's all children. All children are created in the image of God and therefore are my responsibility. I don't know the origin of the story, but I remember Dr. John Westerhoff, my Christian education professor in seminary, telling a story, and the message and image has stayed with me for over 20 years in my work with children. The story was, what if all the children in the world wore crowns, like kings or queens or whatever, wore crowns, and there was a herald or a messenger walking in front of all of them, blowing a trumpet and announcing, make way for the image of God. Make way for the image of God. What if that is what we saw or we kept in mind? Because that's exactly what we should be seeing for every single child. In my research, I looked at the biblical passages that relate to children and I found the work of Judith Gundry Volf to be very helpful. In her article, The Least and the Greatest, Children in the New Testament, she examples the historical and cultural setting of the New Testament material on children, and she concludes that children were both appreciated in various respects and viewed negatively in others. In exploring children in the New Testament, she looked at four particular gospel passages. Mark 10, 13 through 16, Matthew 18, 1 through 5, Mark 9, 33 through 37, and Matthew 21, 14 through 16. I know you can recall what all those are. We're going to talk about one of them. In all of these passages, though, she identifies what she calls the five main ways in which the significance of children is underscored in Jesus' teaching and practice. She delineates them. Number one, Jesus blesses the children who were brought to him and teaches that the reign of God belongs to them. She says that Jesus makes children models of, the reign of, God, of entering the reign of God. That Jesus makes children models of greatness in the reign of God. Fourth, that Jesus calls his disciples to welcome little children as he does and turn service of children into a sign of greatness in the reign of God. And number five, Jesus gives the service of children ultimate significance as a way of receiving him and by implication the one who sent him. 
But it's that fourth category that Gundry Volf talks about that I think has the most implications for child advocacy as I understand it, that serving God and serving children. Listen to that passage, Mark 9, 33 through 37. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they were, had argued with one another about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me but the one who sent me. Gundry Wolf goes on to explain that to receive or welcome one in this setting meant hospitality to guests and it implied serving them. So Jesus' action was much more than just a display of affection. It was a demonstration of service. Thus, to be great in the reign of God, disciples must love and serve children. Gundry Wolf reminds us in her article that children were at the bottom of the social ladder at that time and that caring for children was a low-status job. Some things haven't changed. But Jesus once again reverses things, and now caring for children becomes a mark of greatness. She found two Hellenistic texts of the same time period that also viewed taking children in one's arms in order to love and serve them, which was an action that gained distinction. But she notes that these legendary persons were women and were thus examples for other women. Gundry Wolf concludes, but Mark depicts Jesus, a man taking a little child in his arms, as an example for his male disciples in particular and all disciples in general. There's no gender stereotyping here. Welcoming, the ch welcoming children is the responsibility of all, male and female, who would be great. Jesus thus redefines the service of children as a sign of greatness for all disciples. What appeared to be an undistinguished activity, taking care of children and belonging to the domain of women, became a prime way for all disciples to demonstrate the greatness that corresponds to the reign of God. This places children at the center of the community's attention as prime objects of its love and service. So I began to wonder how the church and how the United States is doing at this, this placing children at the center of the community's attention to love and serve them. I began to wonder about the state of children today. It's been almost 25 years since I taught public school, and it's been over 15 years since I worked with children or youth in a congregation on a full-time basis. I've certainly worked with children in that time period, and I've continued to be involved in helping to raise children, but it's been a while since I've focused on children in my ministry and teaching. In anticipation of working with children in a freedom school, I began to wonder, what was the state of children today? I wanted to know about children in the U.S. and children in the state of Illinois, and what I found was not very encouraging. I read numerous reports related to poverty, early childhood education, literacy, public education, policing in schools, juvenile justice, and mass incarceration. I want to lift up just a very few of these statistics relating to poverty, juvenile justice, and especially education. <clears throat> you already know many of them. These numbers come from the Children's Defense Fund's The State of America's Children 2014 and from the Annie Casey Foundation's 2014 Kids Count Data Book. Both of these offer statistics for the entire U.S. and for Illinois. Related to poverty, the most recent information comes from 2012. Child poverty is defined as a family of four living on less than $23,000 a year. 
There are almost 74 million children living in the U.S. and more than one in five or almost 22 percent of our children are poor. That means 16 million children. And over 40 percent of those children live in extreme poverty which is an annual income for a family of four of less than $12,000 a year. And our youngest children are our poorest children. Over one in four of, the ch of our children under the age of five are poor, which means five million children, and half of them, two and a half million, were extremely poor. In Illinois, the percentage is almost exactly the same, one in five, or about 21 percent, which means 624,272 children in Illinois are poor, and one in 11 of those children live in extreme poverty. In education, the statistics for Illinois are very comparable to the statistics in the U.S. In 2013, in the state of Illinois, 66% of all fourth grade public school children were unable to read at grade level, and 61% were not proficient in math. Early child care and education are important for all children, but especially so for children living in the stressful environment of poverty. Many young children don't benefit from the high quality early childhood education programs. This is the number that always really gets me in the statistics. 96% of all eligible infants and toddlers are not served in early head start due to lack of funding. Let me say that another way. Only 4% of eligible infants and toddlers are served in early Head Start programs when it was, is the most important time period for children. In 2011, the average cost for center-based child care for infants was greater than the cost of annual t tuition at state colleges in 35 states. The average for child care was $9,500 compared to about $8,000 for college tuition. And remember that $9,500 for child care is for families who are making either $12,000 less than or less than $22,000. That's an unfathomable amount with those incomes. Juvenile justice, $4,000. 28 children are arrested every day. That's every 21 seconds a child is arrested in the U.S. Racial and ethnic disparities are rampant, which we know. Children of color ages 10 through 17 represent 16 percent of the overall child population, but they make up 34 percent of children arrested. 38% of children adjudicated, and 68% of children in residential treatment. Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative have brought attention to children in prison. According to the Equal Justice Initiative, almost 3,000 children have been sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Children as young as 13 have been tried as adults without any consideration of their offenses or their, the circumstances of their offenses or their age and sentenced to die in prison. Equal Justice Initiative has argued that such death in prison sentences are unconstitutional and they have won a case before the Supreme Court. Now age and life circumstances must be considered and there's no longer mandatory life in prison sentences for juveniles. But 14 states have no minimum age for trying children as adults. Some states have set the age as 10, 12, and 13 years of age. And on any given day in the U.S., 10,000 children are housed in adult prisons. I've read 
many articles on policing in school and especially about how the zero tolerance policy now has made a direct school to prison pipeline. The Justice Policy Institute has issued two reports, Education Under Arrest, the case against police in schools, and Sticker Shock, calculating the full price tag for youth incarceration. After many of the school shootings in the last 20 years, schools have increased the number of SROs, or school resource officers, police officers in schools. New research shows that such office, officers increase the likelihood that school incidences will be handled as criminal matters rather than school discipline. Matthew Thoreau, a professor at the University of Tennessee, has just done research where he's found that schools with SROs have five times the number of arrests for disorderly conduct as schools without SROs. In a report released last month from the Center for the Study of Race and Equity in Education at the University of Pennsylvania, entitled, the report title is, Disproportionate Impact of K-12 School Suspension and Expulsion on Black Students in Southern States found that 55% of, 55 of all suspensions of black students in grades K-12 through occurred in 13 Southern States. In most cases, the percentage of suspensions was double the representation of the student body. On the average, African American students comprise 24% of the students in the 3,022 districts analyzed, but they made up nearly half of the sus suspensions and expulsions. These are just a small portion of the, of the reports that I've read and the statistics I found, and as I told you, they were not encouraging. But one of the gifts of attending the Proctor Institute for Child Advocacy Ministry at Haley Farm is having the opportunity to hear and talk with children who've been most impacted by the systems I've just discussed. And they have said over and over, we're not statistics. We have stories we want, want you to hear. We want you to get to know us as people, not as statistics. And so I want you to know today that while the statistics are not encouraging, the children they represent are. Their stories are inspiring and courageous. The statistics represent places where we have, where we have failed, not where children have failed. Behind each st statistic is a story, and I want to share a few of those stories with you, mostly in their own words, and then I'll make a few observations. These stories come from three Nashville high school students who are 16 and 17 years of age. The Nashville organizing team of the Children's Defense Fund believes that primary voices must be a part of a conversation about systems. And these primary voices include those persons, those children, who've been most impacted and most at risk. All three of these students are a part of a mentoring program sponsored by a grant written by the Nashville office, and it's run by Damien Durr. You'll hear Mr. Durr's name some in the comments. I heard students talk about poverty, mass incarceration, and many other topics. I want to highlight especially these students' comments about school. They were asked about their experiences with in-school suspensions, referrals, and expulsions. And they all said that with the zero po tolerance policy, that they had all three been either expelled from school or had been sent to alternative school at some point in their school years. So then they were asked, what are some of the problems in the educational system that affect you? And one young man said, with zero tolerance policy, when someone does something wrong, no one asks us, what's wrong and why are you doing this? They see what we did, but they never ask us or talk with us. They send us to ISS, in school suspension, 
And in reality, they're denying us an education rather than teaching us. In ISS or detention, you're expected to learn by yourself with no one helping you. Another young man said, I don't see teachers building relationships with students. They only make demands of us. They don't build relationships. Another young man said, relationships, bonds, family, all matter to youth. Folks don't take into consideration all that we've gone through just to get to school that day. Teachers need to take more time to get to know me as a person. We're all leaders. It just takes the right person to bring it out of us. Encourage us. We don't ever get that. Teachers don't care. That's a big problem. And then they were asked to name some of the positive, helpful things. One young man said, being here at Proctor, it's quiet. In my neighborhood, if it was quiet, that's eerie. But here, when it's quiet, I can let my guard down. Another young man said, positive things keep me going. You all, just to have people listen to me, getting the chance to tell my story, to have Mr. Durr take a chance on me, it keeps me going, it keeps me motivated. And then another young man said, there's not a lot of positive when you're worried about where you're going to sleep or what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear or do you have shoes on your feet and no one calls to check on you. It's kind of hard to keep a positive mindset, but Mr. Durr keeps me motivated and spiritually uplifted. Being at Proctor today, this week, and being able to speak to you has truly been an honor. And then uh, the students were asked, how do you deal with the crisis of your peers dying? And one young man said, I've lost all my friends. I have no friends that I grew up with. From ninth grade to twelfth grade, I've been to twelve funerals. It's hard to cope. Sometimes I cry all night and I ask God why. Why is there violence? I think that plays a role in behavioral issues. Schools don't see that. If you see me walking down the street, you don't know what I've been through, but that's what teachers do to us. They don't take the time to get to know us. People should get to know us. And then lastly, they were, students were asked, what would you say to educators who are looking to speak to children who may have lost hope? And this young man said, be more than an educator. Teach wisdom. Don't be an educator who's only there to do the lesson. I might need some motivation today. I might be feeling down. That might be why I don't want to do any work because of those reasons. But it's taken as an act of defiance and I get sent to ISS or I get expelled when all I wanted was someone to ask what's wrong and to say I understand. Then I'll turn to the work. You can't expect us to respect you if we don't have any kind of relationship. Every educator needs to know each and every one of their students, and if you don't have time to get to know each and every one of your students, do not become a teacher. To which I say, amen. Although these are young men who've taken on many adult responsibilities, I heard children who want to be loved, who want to be heard, who want to be leaders. I heard young men speak of God, but I didn't hear them mention the church. I heard young men talk about schools that seemed to resemble prisons more than classrooms. I heard students who want their teachers to acknowledge their humanity and listen to them. I heard what is considered to be normal childhood or teenage mistakes be considered criminal activities. Dr. Blunt and I have been working on what it would mean if we reimagined Christian education through child advocacy. For me, child advocacy is a form of public theology which occurs at the intersection of faith and justice. My faith calls me to welcome, which means love and serve, children and all children, not just those in our churches. 
And what I found is that we all have different understandings and definitions of child advocacy. In their book, Weaving a Just Future for Children, Diane Olson and Laura Dean Frederick describe advocacy as speaking, intervening, standing, standing for, organizing, and witnessing. And they called advocacy the vehicle that connects pastoral and prophetic mandates. They also delineate four different kinds of child advocacy. Education, which includes learning about the needs and issues. Service, which is developing programs that serve children. Public policy, which is promoting policies, legislation, and funding that support children. And number four, coalition building, which is working together for community concerns. In her book, Thus Far on the Way, a, child, a, the a Theology of Child Advocacy, Elaine Lindner defines child advocacy as removing the stumbling blocks that hinder a child from living the life that God created them to live. I really like that definition, removing stumbling blocks. Dr. Lindner tells a story of going to a Jiffy Lube to get her car serviced and had forgetting to take reading material with her that day. And the only thing on the table in the Jiffy Lube waiting room was a manual on boating. And so she was reduced to reading it. And she said one of the chapters in the manual was on the rules for what happens when two boats encounter each other in the open sea. And the two crafts were designated burdened and privileged. The boat that had the power that they could accelerate and push their way through waves or change direction or stop on demand was called the burdened one. And the craft that was dependent on the forces of nature, the wind, the tide, human effort to keep it going was called the privileged craft. So since powerful boats can make their way forward under their own power, they are burdened with the responsibility to give the right away to the powerless or privileged vessels that are dependent on tide, wind, and weather. So Elaine Lindner asks in her humorous way, as she often does, who wrote this? Billy Graham? Mother Teresa? What's going on when the New Jersey State Department of Transportation knows that the powerful must give way if the powerless are going to make safe harbor and the people of God seem to be having trouble with this concept? I think this speaks powerfully to the idea that child advocacy is removing stumbling blocks so that children can live the life God created them to live and it's being burdened with the responsibility for helping children find safe harbor, not leaving them to fend for themselves. As I said, the project that Dr. Blunt and I have been working on is this intersection of Christian education and child advocacy. We believe that Christian education needs to be profoundly transformed, and we wonder what Christian education would look like if we reimagined it through the lens of child advocacy. One of the goals of such an approach would be to help people understand that the lives of all children are of worth and value to God and that our responsibility is to help remove the stumbling blocks that hinder a child from living the life God created them to live. Today I've shared with you just some of my call and my commitment to welcome children and I've shared with what I call the literature review of the state of children in the U.S. Reggie and I have some ideas about what reimagined Christian education might look like and one of those ways is sponsoring a freedom school as we plan to do next summer here in Evanston. And in this process we're collaborating with churches, schools and other partners in the fifth ward of the city of Evanston and other partners in Evanston. What do you think Christian education might look like 
if we reimagined it through the eyes of child advocacy. Thank you. Are you going to moderate or you want me to? I, okay. <laughs> so we have time for questions or observations or comments. Or, Jennifer? Oh, I'm sorry. So how does the, this understanding of child advocacy, removing stumbling blocks, get played out in the class syllabus? How do we, how do we teach students what that means for them as they go out into the field? Um, Reggie, you want to handle the microphone? Thank you. <laughs> I think part of it is, um, and I'd be interested in the other, other ideas, what I've, what I've found in the last year is it depends on what you mean by child advocacy and those different definitions. And so that's why whether it's education, you know, learning about issues and needs, whether it's public policy, um, um, writing to Congress people, whether it's coalition building. Um, so a part of it I think might be what the a particular class is um, and, and which of those would fit in that category. Is that answering your question? Or? So it is not part of the introduction to the study of child. Oh, oh. But I have a feeling most students think and they think about right. it more. Okay. How do you tell them to, to learn how to remove something like that? Okay. That's, and I'm going to teach a class this coming spring on child advocacy. Um, which is going to be a Christian education class specifically on child advocacy. But um, that's a good question. We're beginning to add to um, my theological education in the parish class, which is one of the introductory classes, Christian ed classes. Um, I've added works this time, um, Leah's work, um, Ferguson, but then also um, Brian Stevenson's book, and so dealing with some of those issues, which are child advocacy issues. So part of it is, for me, it's beginning to add different books and resources to, one, what's going on today, and then secondly, um, how it relates to um, um, who's in the classroom. So yeah, I have done some of that. One of the things, okay, one of the things that has been exposed for us in the empathy gap that has been vividly exposed over the last two years with the killing of black children, particularly unarmed black children, by police, and the major empathy gap, uh, you know, between what was going on and most white Americans, right? Not a few white Americans, most white Americans. Right. Part of what I, you know, a question I will have for you is that. What, as a part of your project, do you do that helps students unlearn what I think is the basis of the empathy gap, and that is that black children belong to black people, period, right? So, so, when, so when you're using the language of our children, mm -hmm. most church structures, that's bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. Most communities, that's nonsense, right? Black children belong to black people, and that's what creates the empathy gap. How do you deal with and help students unlearn that way of moving through the world so that perhaps they can begin to think about these children as everyone's children right. and not just as the children who belong to black right. people, right? Because as yeah. long as that empathy gap is at work, then, you know. Mm -hmm. That's the question, and that's, that's part of what we're working on. Um, when I said one of the goals, um, we're presenting papers at, at REA and um, APT this fall on this project, and so we've been thinking about what would, um, if this is a, an approach to Christian education, 
of those goals being that all children are of value to God and all, um, I just read it, I've forgotten what the, the second one was, but um, is first holding that up because I think we also have a, a view in the U.S. that all children belong to their parents. Um, that, that it, you know, I, I'm always surprised. I'm someone who believes it takes a village to raise a child. That was, I told you a little bit about my background because that's, I grew up in that kind of community. Um, and I hear parents say, no, other people don't have any, it's not their damn business what my child does. And so it's, it's beginning to talk about all children being our responsibility. Um, so I don't know whether we can get to what you, I'm working toward getting to what you were saying, but I think it's even bigger than that. Our children belong to particular families or particular um, um, communities. And I'm, I am, I, that's, I'm very much fighting against that. That especially in the church, um, that that my theology says they are all, all children are our children. So I'm still trying to work out that question, Stephen. I'm, I'm interested in what other, how other people are answering that. Hi. Hi. Is this thing on? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to sit because it's a little crowded back here. Sure. Um, but I really enjoyed your theological framework as the basis for advocacy. And the question I was asking towards the end as you were approaching the burden and the privilege and how do we see ourselves, which boat are we, how do we assess our burdenness and our privilege? And my question was theologically, how will you flesh that out in Christian education to empower students to see themselves in light of burdenness and privilegedness? And then from a theological perspective, um, so because you went through that process as you were interpreting your own story and interpreting scripture, how will you do that in the classroom? Um, again, I'm beginning to think through that. Um, Many um, students, if you've had, theolo um, had teaching for biblical faith, you know that you do a, um, um, uh, what's it called, Reggie, the survey, the hermeneutical survey, um, where you go through and look at um, how, your, um, how who you are and, and your experiences shape how you view the Bible. Um, I'm beginning, and so I use that in that class, and that often brings out particular understandings. Um, Reggie and I've just talked about this um, summer and this fall with the theological education in the parish class, and talk about it because we both teach both of those classes, um, and they're the required classes. Um, how can we um, um, design an instrument of looking at your um, your, uh, uh, who you are looking through that theological lens as well as that, to, to make it not only biblical but theological. I'm not saying that very well. But, and often it takes um, bringing those things to light because often I remember getting to college and being surprised that everybody didn't live in an extended family intergenerational household and my mom had been the um, bookkeeper for the, the family farm and handled all the money in the family. I got to call, it was college before I found out that wasn't the norm. I thought everybody's mother handled all the money. Um, and so it, those kind of things that we take as normal or normative until we are forced to examine them are one way that I um, attempt to help students think through that. Yes, yes. To others, I mean, questions or your own ideas and experiences that have worked in um, advocacy for children. So one important question might be, how do families and community defend their children? Uh, so that we recognize uh, a protective and justice um, agency uh, in communities and families that experience, is it right, those conditions 
of violence and discrimination, uh, and and how do then do we recognize and connect with that agency, which is also present there, because I cannot imagine uh, people being under such uh, distress conditions without responding mm -hmm. uh, in multiple ways. Uh, but but again, the question is, how do we recognize as agency and connect with that and resource that and you see what I'm saying as part of of the learning that needs to happen, let's say in our classrooms. Okay, I'm not sure what your question is. Well, the, the question is, you know, how do you bring or how how do you help students and leaders to recognize? the agency of families and community who are protecting their children right. in the midst of, of those conditions. Right. Again, acknowledging, um, I remember being a part of an event last year at the Religious Education Association Conference um, here in Chicago, and it was un, um, Christian education's role in the unmaking of violence. And we had um, field trips, and we went to different places. And one of the field trips that I went to was to the, and now I'm not going to think of the name, of a law school downtown. Which law school? John. Okay. And it was a, a, on a Saturday, and it was looking at um, restorative justice policy or um, um, programs uh, rather than, um, have I got the, the language right, instead of, um, um, retribution or it, it's restorative. Am, am I using the right language? Okay. And yet one of the, um, I, I listened to all of it and it all made perfect sense to me until I started having a conversation later. Um, actually Leah and I were having a conversation, Leah Gunning Francis who was here last week, um, and we began to talk about, um, because part of what they talked about is whether you were the um, um, the offender or the offendee, many of the emotions or, or um, issues and concerns are the same. And so how do you address both of those in those um, practices? But then we got to talking about what happens when we have the numbers that I just talked about in the judicial system where persons are not, um, uh, um, the representation is not comparable to the population. And so then it's a different story because if you're doing, um, Brian Stevenson in his TED talk on, uh, I've forgotten the name of it, something about justice, made the comment that you have a better, um, you bet, have better options in the judicial system if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and um, innocent. And so that makes a lot of difference then when you're talking about um, uh, maybe the, the question is not restorative justice pro uh, processes, but the, the um, number of innocent persons. He also, those numbers about children in prison, um, this statistic or that always sticks with me about um, Equal Justice Initiative works for persons who are on death row. And right now the statistics are one in nine of all persons um, execute, they, they found that one in nine persons on death row are innocent. And so his observation was, so we're, we're killing one in nine innocent persons, or, or one in nine of those persons are innocent. And he said, we wouldn't allow an airline to take off nine times if we knew that every nine times one of the planes was going to crash. But why are we so comfortable with the judicial system the way it is? Oh. So I don't think I answered your question, Louise, but I don't know. Thank you. I have two questions. Uh -huh. One. Uh, give me the top three things you desire from theology from this perspective. And Ooh. two, give me the top three things you want our churches to do right now, uh, right now, uh, from this I've, perspective. I've, 
that's funny because I've been debating about that. Um, top three things. Top five. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, top three things for churches. Um, one is to. Um, I had some of these written down that I didn't didn't leave in, and now I'm blanking. But um, one would be to acknowledge. Um, the, the realities. Um, Stephen talked about that, that the, the, um, the statistics and the stories of children is that they're our children, that we not consider um, only our children. The, for me, the, the, the problem with Christian education, at least the way I have understood it often, we talk about Christian education, we're talking about in our churches. Um, and so Christian education is for our children when they come to Sunday school or youth group or whatever. How do we start understanding Christian education as not just children in the church but, but children in our community? So I guess the first thing is I'd like for churches to um, find out who's in their community and talk with them. Um, I kept hearing over and over from children, um, they want someone to tell their story. They want you to listen to them. Um, and I found that when I was teaching. So one is, is get outside of the doors of the church and find out who the, the children are in the community. Um, and then number two, um, I don't think there's a, um, students in my class know this question was asked other week about, you know, so what should I do? And I don't know that there's one answer for every church. I think I would want churches to, um, determine one, what they're gifted at and called to do, and then second, what is in their community that needs to be done? Is it education, um, tutoring, is it um, policy issues, is it um, advocating for um, um, budget changes, those kind of things? And then, um, I don't know for the third one, but in theology, the, the thing um, Reggie talks about a lot and we've been talking about is this whole the, um, theological anthropology. Do we really believe that, um, or often we act like God has a hierarchy. Do we really believe that God doesn't have a hierarchy? So I want churches to think about that, that what they're teaching um, explicitly and what they're teaching implicitly. Thank you for your um, bringing us this wonderful topic. Uh, as someone who worked uh, with children uh, in a different setting in Brazil um, and have to work between the church environment but also close enough with the favelas. Uh, one thing that always um, was very important for me and for my learning with those children uh, is that Many times we, we think about what are the statistics, what are the things told about children, and less worry or concern about how the children see themselves. And um, I think one of our uh, tasks uh, in Christian education and in theological education is not so much to uh, know about children from things, readings and things that we do, but also to learn how they see themselves and how they are able to tell about their stories. And then we, we will change our, even our theology, just hearing their stories and how they connect and how they are theologians in their own ways. So I think uh, this work with them and being able to listen 
through and see things through their eyes will make a lot of the difference that we are seeking to accomplish in our work. So this is just like I think you are bringing a lot of uh, this important uh, topic to the front of our conversation on theological education. Um, and I think this is important. This is something that we need to do. And we need to do with them, not for them, but with them. So it's just a comment and a compliment. Uh,